Welcome back to the show this morning. Daily graphic is starting. The big one, we haven't abandoned tardy girls. President reiterates in Western region. Uh, the photograph of the president uh, captured here. Uh, vigilantism bill finally passed. Uh, that's on the daily graphic too. The anticipation is on. The finance minister is expected to present budget review Monday. And large borrowing leading to debt and sustainability in Africa. That's from... A World Bank economist. The Ghanaian Times this morning says President launches community mining program to provide jobs for 4,500 miners. Police beef up security at the University of Education, Winneba, and Supreme Court adopts 11 million Ghana cities minimum price for Woyomi's properties. And uh, the Daily Guide this morning says Woyomi mansions sell 11.7 million cities, and uh, we will get back tardy girls. The find that MDS blow 5.1 billion between 2014 and 2018. That's according to the Auditor General. And the community mining program launch also gets some ink on the finder this morning. Those are some of the papers I have with me uh, this Friday morning. And to do the talking, uh, as a member of the NDC team, Elik Pilim Kotoko. Good morning. Hope you're doing great. I'm doing very good. Thank you so much. It's uh, Elikam. Elikem. Oh, so, sorry, <laughs> I didn't mean Elikem. Yeah, We're still waiting for rep from the NPP, and uh, certainly we'll have to keep the conversation going. Yeah. Grateful, once again, Eli, for your time yeah. with us. Now, yeah. let me take a look at the Daily Graphic this morning. Now, President Kufado has said the government is not sleeping over the missing Takradi girls, speaking to a gathering at Bordier Dompen in the Amenfi West District last Wednesday as part of his tour. He assured the affected families and the nation that everything would be done to rescue them. He said the security agencies were working with all seriousness on the quiet and expressed optimism that the effort would pay off. Uh, we are not sleeping on the three missing young women. It is important to note that those involved are wicked and crafty people and the team is working to rescue them. President Akufado said. Now, uh, expatiating on the matter, President Akufado said that three kidnapped girls were Ghanaians who had to be rescued or protected like any other uh, Ghanaian. If any despicable thing happens, as it has happened to the three girls, the government will be there to marshal its forces, locate them, and rescue them. And that will be done in the case of the girls, he said. The president said the criminals who engaged in such acts were crafty and would always be looking for information on what the investigation team was doing in order to outwit them. Therefore, the president said it was not everything that would be communicated or put up in the open. Let me introduce my other guest, a member of the NPP team, uh, Eric Chun, is also here. Good morning. Good morning, Brian. I hope you're doing great. I'm doing fantastic. Thanks for your time. Let's start the conversation. Uh, Elikem, uh, the, the president's assurance, uh, the family says, indeed, it is reassuring. What do you make of it? Uh, thank you so much, and, and good morning to our viewers. And uh, I do not know if you are now on the same page on that. This mm. morning, I listened to a sister station, and right. uh, a spokesperson for the family, one Hayford, uh, stated categorically that the president's assurances were not enough. And I think rightly so, because this matter has taken the proportion it has gained as a result of the gross display of insensitivity of government towards this mm -hmm. uh, situation. Mm -hmm. How long now since these girls got missing? And as president of the nation, uh, how long has it taken him to respond or to even comment on this, to show care, especially uh, when at the last uh, 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 State of the Nation address, the entire nation, the entire nation expected that the president was going to pass a comment on that to show that as the first gentleman of the, of, the, of the nation, he was aware of what was happening and understood the plight of the families. But no mention of that. And that was the height of insensitivity from government in relation to this. Nobody is saying that they are responsible, but you see, every citizen ought to be protected, and mm -hmm. that is one one of the rights that we have here as, a mem as members of, of this country. And if therefore, what is even most very painful again is that the family also feel that it is disrespectful of the president, the manner in which he's conducting himself in relation to this matter. Because he has been on a tour in the western region 
and he didn't find it necessary at all to even visit the family and console with them. But rather, he was somewhere else and just passing a message on to them. But don't forget, it only tells you uh, what the regime is actually up to. Mm. I'm sure you heard of news of uh, one chief from Discov who was also assaulted. Uh, this happened just some few days ago, or 24 hours or so, and we were told the president visited the chief to, 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 to commiserate or to console the, the, the victim, the chief. And you see, if you do things of this nature, you give room for people to propound so many theories into why you are doing so. Mm -hmm. Nobody is saying that you do not need to go and visit the chief anyway. But you've gone to do so. Is it because the family of the missing girls are not that influential? They are not so important. You don't see them to be influencers. And therefore, for them, you can just stand somewhere else and pass a comment over this in, in the situation in which they are. Mm -hmm. and, and it's very appalling, to say the least, because considering the fact that for over a year now, we were in this country when uh, two Canadian girls got missing, got kidnapped, and in just a split second of some hours or days, we f they, were, they, were, they were found, they were rescued. And it's... We are in August, so it's almost it's a year now since these incidents have been reported. And government has failed to tell us what exactly it is doing. And don't forget, the reason why Ghanaians are most worried and will be trumpeting this is because, if you recall as well, President Akufuado, then candidate Akufuado, held press conferences and at various occasions was telling Ghanaians of the level of insecurity in Ghana and he was reassuring Ghanaians of how he was going to make sure that Ghana was safe, people can go about conducting their businesses and the streets will be safe for them. Mm. But what are we saying? What are we seeing today? Definitely there are pockets of incidents that you and I can make mention of and we will never end this program if we have to recall all the various incidents of insecurity that we are witnessing in the country. And I mean, just recently the IGP was fired it only lays credence to what we have been saying, that it appears there isn't any proper coordinated effort to ensure the safety and security of, of, of Ghanaians. Because I recall the president also saying that the incidents of the Ayawa so West were gone, etc., were some of probably what necessitated this suck. And so it is not surprising, but it is very disturbing. And the Ghanaian can no longer even go out at night, probably after 6 p.m. And that is very worrying. This was not the Ghana that was handed over to President Akufuado. And therefore, it is two things. It is either he improves it or just leaves it the way it was handed to him. Rather, if not, then uh, the situation is very precarious. Eric, if you take a look at if you uh, look at the Daily Graphic, sorry, there's one Michael Hayford who uh -huh. uh, speaks for the families. Yes. I have heard another member of the family suggest that, um, well, it's reassuring, but the Daily Graphic story says that Michael Hayford, who speaks for the family, said the president's comments were not consoling enough since he failed to include the families in his planned tour of the region. Uh, he said that he is surprised that the number one man of the land failed to visit the families to give them words of assurance and rather chose to speak on it from far away, just like Eli Kem is um, uh, attributing to. Uh, perhaps, should the president have gone to the family? Thank you very much. Um, good morning once again. Mm. Uh, good morning to Eli Kem. Uh, I think that um, this is the second time I'm bumping <laughs> to him this week. Um, yeah. And then also good morning to all the viewers of uh, TV3 this mm. morning. I mean, my position on this thing is very simple. And I, I mean, I've stated it that it's a responsibility of every government to ensure the safety of its citizens and the security of the state. Uh, if you like, that's probably the most important or the paramount responsibility of any government. Now, if you extend that and one reason or the other, a citizen of the country finds themselves in some kind of bother. And like in this particular case of uh, girls being abducted or kidnapped or, I mean, basically missing. Um, if you ask me again, it's the responsibility of government to ensure that uh, investigations are done with alacrity and the girls are brought home. And that's essentially what this government has done. Um, it's unfortunate that because of political expediency, uh, our friends would try to jump on the bandwagon and sort of try to milk or take some cheap political 
capital out of it. But that is, I mean, it's politics for them. I mean, that's a given. But the fact on the ground does not point to this thing. Again, in any form of investigation, you don't come out to tell everybody what you're doing or what the processes are by virtue of that fact that mm -hmm. it might actually alert the perpetrators of that particular act as to what actions are being taken by the security authorities, for instance. So, I mean, for you to try and create an impression that uh, the government is insensitive and the president is insensitive to the matter and all of those things, it's neither here nor there. I think that if you recall, a lot of uh, efforts have actually gone into this thing, trying to uh, find out where the girls are and bring them back home, to the point that I think that there's one gentleman that has been uh, in police custody for even the word go, who for some reason was able to actually jump uh, uh, the incarceration. He was actually at the police station and he jumped before he was sent to, to court. And the police had to go back and uh, find him and bring him back to uh, their uh, police station to, of course, uh, activate court processes for even jumping um, arrest or something of that sort. So things have gone in a particular direction. I think like a couple of months ago, there was also news that one of the suspects had actually been apprehended in Togo or Benin somewhere. You know, so whilst it's unfortunate and it's sad and it's, it's really, uh, if you like, unbearable for the families to deal with this matter, because I have kids, I have uh, daughters as well. So if, even for nothing at all, you would have to put yourself in the shoes of those family members and friends that uh, their uh, kids have actually been abducted or kidnapped or they just can't find them. I mean, it would be extremely uh, difficult for any parent or guardian or any family member to deal with these things. But you see, we have to be uh, candid with ourselves and sometimes uh, take the politics out of these kind of conversation. That some of these things, because of the way it's done and the time frame that would have to elapse before, I think that attention was actually brought to this matter. Right? It's almost very extremely difficult to solve. It's a very delicate thing, it's complex and all of those things. So for me, I think that what the president has done is, is the right thing. To By not visiting the family? No, I mean, I mean that is your That is view. the family's complaint. Yes, yeah, but the, the point is that, um, like I keep saying, in this particular dispensation, mm -hmm. people have every right to prefer divergence in opinions and all that. There's nothing wrong with that. Mm -hmm. I mean, maybe you should have gone there, maybe you should have gone there, or um, other members of government, like either the uh, regional minister and all of those things, would be able to support that by visiting the families. Uh, I know that the police liaison officers have been um, attached to the various families to make sure that there's some kind of information flow and all of those things. So again, it's, you can say that um, because it's a sensitive issue and all of those things, I really focus too much, so much on the attempts that is being made to bring the girls. You see, it's also very unfortunate that there's a certain attempt by the uh, NDC to create a certain correlation between this and the Canadian girls incident. And you recall that I didn't hear about this Takradi girls thing probably for uh, two months or, or a month after the incident had happened. Mm -hmm. And you realize that the difference between this and the, um, the Canadian one is that immediately it happened. I think that there was a lot of uh, public interest, uh, I mean, news reportage and all of those things. And I think that they were within a particular jurisdiction, so the police or security uh, agencies moved in real quick to make sure that the, either the, the victims are not taken out of that particular jurisdiction. So every, every crime of, I mean, of this nature is different. I believe strongly that uh, it's important that we support the, the security agencies. And of course, edge that whatever it is that they are doing, they uh, expedited the act with a lot more dispatch and alacrity so that we can bring the girls home. But for the first gentleman of the land, I think that his 
core responsibility is to assure and give hope to the families that, well, my government is doing everything that it can to bring the girls home. For any family member or anybody that is um, uh, attached or has some kind of attachment to the family, it can never be reassuring enough until the girls are actually brought home, you understand? So for that, I can understand that, I mean, until the girls come home, they would always believe that something more should be done, we should act quickly, all sorts of things they would have to come in terms of support, counseling, all of those things are key things that I think that will help to bring them home. But to do the politicking of it, and he made a, a point that I thought that would have been the trajectory that we will take. Because I can sit here and now uh, go back and list all sort of security incidents that happen under your watch, and we can go back and forth and all of those things. But you see, it's also not good to focus too much on the negatives. So even in some of these cases that have happened, which they've used as a basis to claim that there's some kind of insecurity and chaos and there's mayhem and people cannot leave their homes after 6 p.m. This is the most ridiculous thing to start with. It's important that we also commend the uh, police when they do uh, fantastic work. Some of these incidents have happened and the police have got into the bottom of it within a, a couple of days but or so. So a report that says that uh, these armed robbery and other but incidents have increase. gone down. So uh, yeah, no, but there's a statistic. What, I, that, that, what is the point you're that, that is the, Yes, that is exactly my point. Uh -huh. You see that if so you look at... It's not wrong saying that the, the level of it hasn't. It hasn't. I mean, I, the, the, the police level, report doesn't say no. But if you hasn't. do, if you do, if you do, you do a just opposition. And the thing is, I'm saying that even one incident of insecurity and crime or whatever is bad in itself. But I'm saying that if you go and take maybe the police uh, crime statistics of 2015, 2016, 2014, Why do you want to go to, back? I don't know but because you see, it's a statistical. It's maps. It doesn't lie. So if you you, you, you have a gentleman like this sit on this platform and say that, well, there's total chaos, there's insecurity, and all of those things. It has to be backed by statistics. It is not the police report that specific. Yes, but the police has reports that days back 2005 to 2004. And how else are you able to now do a certain comparative analysis and say that, well, when it comes to incidents like murder, robbery, uh, abduction, kidnapping, and all of those things, uh, in this particular year, is, that is a comparison. So is it your so point, is it your my point, point because is, it was bad in 2015, it is normal that it is bad? I, I haven't, I point? know, but come on, I mean, I, I, unless you're not listening to me. My point is that mm. even if one incident, even if one Ghanaian citizen or anybody that happens to be in this jurisdiction mm. finds themselves in a kind of border that is preventable, because you can see, sometimes some of these things are also important to state. As unfortunate as it is, even for the most advanced countries in the world who have all the best security apparatuses and systems in place, mm. crime does happen. And now the most important thing is that what happens after these things have happened, uh, th making sure that you have the right systems in place, the right tools in place to solve these things. So really, we can't sit here and pretend that you can go into any part of this world, any country at all, and crime does not happen. Okay. It's what happens, yeah, yeah, what pertains yeah. okay. when these things does right, happen. But I'm let, saying that the rapper, facts, let me get the facts on the ground, the statistics, and the sort of, uh, if you like, fear and panic that uh, Elikem tried to portray to claim that today in this country, I don't, I don't, know, I don't know where he goes, that today in this country, when it's 6 p.m., everybody is locked in indoors and then you cannot go out. That is not true. That okay. is politics. Well, okay. Okay. well, quickly, well just, uh, I, I think we can move. the length of time he's taken on this matter alone tells that he's struggling to try to justify <laughs> this. You see, in the first place, let us... Let, the conversation before <laughs> came, that's why let, let, us, let us take note that Suddenly, the NPP is trying to patronize mediocrity if they want to begin to praise the president for at least assuring the people. 
What caused the president to fail to assure the people during the State of the Nation address, which was he a grandiose occasion he, for everyone to have listened the to him. The during the State of the Nation address, the he never did. And the oh, family was on. even angry over that. The president you are a oh, media person. You can confirm or deny for me whether it, the president did anyway, that or you can, he never you did. Can, you can need and, 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 and secondly, go fishing uh, as well. Secondly, as well. Eric, was it in the State of the Nation address? The president made mention of incidents of that nature. Was in there any chaos in the State of the Nation? You see, no, Eric, you can't get there, there, there yes no, so that when it gets right, your turn, right, you, can, right, you can expatiate. Right, right, because it's right. Henry Kemp's turn. So, okay. I'm just asking you, I can, that you I can, I can allow him, him to finish so uh -huh. that I'll come okay. in. All right. Okay, okay. If, granted, if granted the latitude of time. The mm -hmm. second thing I want to also make mention of is don't forget that we have an IGP that has just been fired. What is even the implication of that? It could probably even mean that all this work, whatever they have been doing so far has never yielded a single result and for which reason he deserves to be fired. Right. That's Maybe. So, that's also so, so, so no, ridiculous. No. That's also well, ridiculous. Eric, ridiculous. That is, that that is why, you, so you that that is why, that is why I'm saying that when you fail to communicate with the people, mm -hmm. they are free to propound so many theories based on what they assume because there's a failed communication between you and them. And don't also forget, thirdly, that we have a CID boss who is still at post, who is confident enough that she is the best person for where, uh, whichever position she is. And she came to mislead the whole nation, reassuring us, giving us fake hope that she and her officers knew the location of these girls, which was a blatant lie. She did that on national TV at a press conference, and she still had the effrontery not to appropriately apologize and even resign. But in Ghana, that is what happens. We actually sort of endorse such kind of activities. Where would you have done this? Knowing that she's a mother herself and at least having an understanding of the plight of the families. And you come and sit on national TV and say, oh, don't worry, we are we know the location of the girls and you see it also defeats the purpose of what my brother was trying to suggest that you can't give us certain information yes we agree we are not saying that tell us that we have found them at uh, banchiasi in takradi here exactly here in this no you just as you said that you know their location you said you know their location yes but what has happened you come and sit on national tv to lie to us it only meant that there are people who have become squared pegs in round holes Unless we want to massage the issue, then we can pretend to be going around it and say, oh, she's not been nice, she didn't do well. But she's completely incompetent and does not deserve to occupy that position. And this must be told to Tiwa Adudankwa straight in the face, so that she knows herself that, look, she has been a disaster of a CID boss. You see, right. Eric, wrap up in this. Right. You see, yeah. it's okay to use these opportunities to run down people and personalize this conversation. I think that is extremely insensitive to use this as a propaganda uh, tool for the NDC. To start with, this whole idea that any government, any government at all, um, would, for one reason or the other, decide that it's not interested in uh, getting to the bottom of a matter that is as uh, serious and as heinous as this, is ridiculous to start with. Again, our friends would give you, will copiously quote the constitution and the rights of people and what it does and everything by expediency. The president has every single right, prerogative, to uh, appoint and disappoint people, including the IGP. It does not necessarily mean that you can adduce or you can come up with all sort of conspiracy theory as to why the president has removed an IGP and tried to link it. It's the Adama Lizard uh, uh, theory. Mm -hmm. So let's put everything together. Let's make sure that all these narratives make sense or is logical in our own thinking, in our own warped thinking. The truth of the matter is that, like I stated, I have kids. I don't know if you do, or I mean, I'm sure uh, Brad does. Mm -hmm. But I have children. So if my, my kids go to school or whatever, and they are meant to come home at 4 p.m., and they don't even come home at 4 p.m. after half an hour or so, I'll be worried. That is the most significant aspect of this conversation. So for you, because you are in opposition and you want to come back to power and you have people who have found themselves in this kind of border and you want to use you to do power, that is fine. But I know that you can't sit here and say that at 6 p.m. every evening, Ghanaians lock themselves in their houses because, because of a president, Akufuado government, uh, there's so much insecurity and chaos, and this is like a, a banana republic. And, and that's why I feel that when we have these conversations, especially, the, it's also the responsibility of the, 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 the media, because you are meant to be the, like the referee, mm -hmm. that you interrogate it. 
that is it true that the crime rate statistics has actually increased? Yes. Is it, it is, is it true? And then, I yeah, but you see, maybe, 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 maybe no, but you compared to what? Maybe that would have well, been great when the like, yeah, yeah, but if you say, uh, how can you, how can you, how can you have statistics? The police in the first place of 2019 at least, said that crime statistics have gone up. Uh, but, uh, compared to what? Will this say that not, compared to No, I mean, anything. they say you have to uh, credit it, it, as in it, it, compared to the 2019 first quarter, 2018 first quarter. The police said that. Yes. The statistic... But the you are, I, I haven't seen it, and I okay. would be, I would be but you interested. Don't, you don't, so you don't believe my information? Uh, no, yeah, because you haven't okay. shown me the evidence oh, right. of that information. Uh, I, it is the police that says. <laughs> yeah, you, you understand. And what I'm saying okay. is that even that's if you okay. want to, if you want to do that, mm -hmm. if you want to do that, and I will not sit this here. This is first quarter 2019. Yeah. And yes, to but first quarter I would, I would not sit here and say that if somebody uh, has any issues or a citizen of this country. Uh, finds themselves in some kind of danger or something, or it's not the, respons the ultimate responsibility mm. of the state to ensure that they are protected. But the point is that it's, it's also important, maybe with stopping short of sounding insensitive, it's also important to state that there is no nation in the world, there's no country in the world that people will not get up and be up to some kind of mischief or try to perpetrate crime and all of those things. It is what happens afterwards. And I'm saying that even in some of these incidents that Ali Kem and his, uh, uh, his courts have tried to portray, it is a, it is the, the police, the, the police, are yeah, but you see, when you, when you, when you, you see, you can't he's failing, he's failing to appreciate. You can't, you can't, you can't, you can't, listen, you can't, yes, but I, I, and I agree that they will be worried. And I say that they have every right to be worried. Okay. And I'm saying, but you see, when you move it from that emotional, sensitive uh, family or whatever uh, relationship to politicking, like Elikem is doing, where now he would, he would basically uh, project a particular incident and make it look like <laughs> it's been replicated across the entire length and breadth of this country, okay. and there's a state of chaos and anarchy in this country. And I'm saying that it's also my responsibility to also point out to him that that is not the case. Grateful. Isn't it surprising that the president was in the Western region? In even he visited Takoradi, but he never made mention of the let, incident let, in Takoradi. Let's, let's talk about when Koko. he was out of Takoradi. Let, let, let's so talk someone about, just reminded let, Let's talk about Koko now. Daily Graphic, page 19, says the minority in parliament has called on the president of Kufado to focus on cleaning what it describes as the mess his government has created in the cocoa sector. They contended that the first ever highest yield of one million tons of cocoa in cocoa production was realized under the Mills Mahama National Democratic Congress in, in the 2010-2011 cocoa season was the second highest. 996,000 tons took place under the watch of President John Dramani Mahama in the 2016-2017 season. Uh, Mr. Eriko Poku, uh, the MP for Sunafo South, who and a member of the Select Committee on Food and Agriculture, said the facts of the NDC's performance in the cocoa sector could be verified at page paragraph 403 of the NPP's 2018 budget statement presented to Parliament. He said cocoa farmers today were far worse off as exemplified in the steady decline of production. Um, uh, he goes on to say that the president wanted uh, the NDC to mention uh, one uh, measure they put in to improve cocoa production. He said under the NDC, under President Mahama, they introduced the free fertilization of cocoa farms policy in the 2013-14 crop season, repeated it the following season to boost cocoa production. And also he said that uh, the second highest, um, the second thing they did was uh, the introduction of the free spraying. Okay, the free spraying for the 2016-17 cocoa season as captured in paragraph 403 of the NPP's 2018 budget statement. So he goes on and on and on trying to um, list what he says the NDC did to improve the cocoa sector. This is the confusion. Elikem, let me start yeah. this conversation with yeah. you. You do not think that the, the two parties today should be talking about how we have been able to perhaps 
add value to our cocoa, particularly when almost these two parties think that the best thing is to stop this, this gadgets back economy of uh, uh, selling raw materials. Thank you, my brother. I think, this, I wish this question goes to the NPP and government. They, yeah, you, yeah, but you see, because they are in government and expected to know much better and do better, but they wish to meddle rather in populist propaganda to achieve mischief and just to score cheap political points. The president stated that he inherited a mess. Mm. Let it be put on record that it is Ghanaians rather who mistakenly elected a mess. He didn't inherit a mess because after all, while in opposition, he was saying himself he knew the state of the economy, he knew whatever. So it was not up to him to now be in power three years after being in power and continuously being talkative and complaining to Ghanaians that he inherited a mess. It meant rather that Ghanaians elected a mess who cannot deal with the issues at, at, at stake. Now, let us not forget, the president is doing everything in his position to try and cleanse himself out of the numerous corruption scandals that has dented his image and his presidency. For which reason he feels that the only straws he can lash on now is to find a way to do nothing than to hit at none other than even President Mahama. Because he finds it difficult to even hit at the, the NDC itself. Isn't it patronized of mediocre once more to be making mention of the fact that the highest yield time was in President Mills and uh, Mahama era? The President Mahama was still in there. He was the vice president. And let it be put on record that I think the handlers of the president have been failing him continuously. He may only have to keep coming and be telling us that he's unaware or he's been misled. I mean, it is easily verifiable if you go to cocobot.gh, mm. you go to the statistics, you realize the records over there, which shows that the second highest yield that we ever had was in the 2016 2017 year. That was under that was the President Mohammed's last time, and that was 969,000 9, tons. And I expect that the media should not even be asking me if that is true or not. The media should know. They should be able to verify that because there's a verifiable source for you to know that from. And so if the president is now saying that he inherited a mess and all that, let's ask him. There were these projects called the Cocoa Roads Project. Suddenly, when you came to power, you halted the programs because you said you were going to conduct an audit into these prog programs. You have wasted over $10 million, $10 million in just auditing this. How, mu many, how much more can we not do with that amount? And so for you, I do not know what informed the president's decision. It appears at any time he gets excited by a few people of his own cronies he sees right sitting in front of him, and he's tempted to want to say things out of, out of the box. And then he ends up embarrassing himself. Because these records are available for everyone to see. Aren't we in this country, aren't we aware of the fact that fertilizers that are meant not to be sold have been sold uh, or have been smuggled out and the planting for food fertilizers are being smuggled out of this country. Fertilizers that are supposed to be given free of charge to farmers. You came to power and you began giving it to them at a price of 80 CDs per bag. So the farmers couldn't afford it and therefore the fertilizers were lying there and got expired. And when it was even getting expired, that was when they began to want to try to to, to give it out to the farmers. In the end, we saw thousands of bags of fertilizers that have gotten, that, that are expired. This is causing huge financial loss to the public purse. And these Ghanaians are very much aware of. We've also done the free distribution of the cocoa hybrid seedlings, which has also yielded uh, 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 our production over the period. Don't also forget that aside the cocoa rules that we're making mention of, the solar powered boreholes, that is about 117 of such, mm. are dotted all over in the cocoa communities. We have also the schools that we have put up, the 23 of such schools. They have abandoned all these projects. Then the mass spraying. And you see, when we talk of cocoa roads, I would want to even rope in the cashew scenario because they are also farmers. When President Akufuado was then candidate Akufuado, he was chastising President Mahama that he expects President Mahama to increase the price of the cashew bag from uh, 850 or 900 cities per bag to 2,500. But today, as we speak, visit the Bono region where it is most prevalent in, in terms of the farming. And the price has dropped from 850 to 190 cities per bag. And you want you, to you tell... You know that for a fact. That is for a fact. A bag of cash. You, you can cross-check it immediately. I'm on your studios and in your studios and you can cross-check that. Look, I was in the Bono region myself and look, it is pathetic that our farmers will talk to go through all these and government feels this government who said that uh, President Mahama ought to have increased this to 2,500, has rather reduced it from 850 to 190 something, less than 200. 
And you see, till when will it even reach 250, 300 before getting back to where it was and be restored? And so you cannot admit yourself as president outside the country that times are hard, we are facing hardships. Then again come when you meet the, 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 the natives themselves in the country, then you are pretending to put, paint a picture as if all is rosy and everything is moving on well. Look, the average Ghanaian is suffering. And not until the president owns up to be able to appreciate the fact and tell them that, look, I admit what is going on. We are having some challenges because either we misconstrued this or we misinterpreted this or we didn't understand that and for which reason this was. Because where are the competent men? It is just becoming even the musical chairs. We are shifting people from one place to the other. Pius Enam Hajide had the incident of the visa racketeering. To date, it meant nobody was involved in that, but we know there was a scandal because nobody has been found guilty. He has just been promoted, pushed to somewhere else. The, the Ghana Maritime boss, uh, Kwame Usu, who have had himself soiled with whatever happened at Ghana Maritime, he's amongst one of the competent men they have and therefore they cannot leave him aside. They have to reposition him to another place. Where are the competent men? The voices of the Senate may be very quiet. So your point they, is what? My point is that there's crass incompetence within the regime where nobody knows what to do. And for which reason the handlers of the president also keep misinforming him and he gets excited by the figures and the things they throw at him because he's becoming a monumental failure. And this is legendary in the history of Ghana. Let me sum it up by getting to the fact of the corruption thing that is the reason why I'm saying this. Because don't forget Transparency International's rating of this government so far has been very abysmal. Their pe best performance was 41% they scored last year. And only God knows what will be their performance for this year. And this was some of the yardsticks they were using while in opposition. And for someone to say that, oh, this is a usual popular propaganda, political, no. Look, right, you would agree with me that even the quality of water you drink, it takes a political decision. The quality of air you drink takes a political decision. The light you have in your house takes a political decision. So like it or not, every single step we take as humans in life takes a political decision. And therefore, if myself here as a position member or as a citizen first and foremost, and a member of the opposition, you think that when I comment on issues, it's based on the fact that I'm doing propaganda or part of the opposition. That is very wrong because it means you are taking away from me my right of citizenship and only considering me as a position member, which is very flawed. Grateful. Eric, let me put the same question to you. Shouldn't we be talking about how perhaps we have uh, we are adding value to cocoa we have a factory that almost 80 percent of our cocoa we are exporting is going to be processed in in accra here and not be talking about who uh, achieved uh, the highest time <laughs> i i was trying to follow uh, lkm when he was submitting his uh, he was making a submission but i didn't really get the head and tail of it uh, it's gone all over the place. So, of course, when you come with a, a prescripted uh, uh, narrative, that's what happens. I You're see. talking about cocoa. You're talking about the fact that this particular sector, which for me, um, and I think that for everybody, has probably been the most important in terms of its uh, contribution to our economy for the last 100 years or so. And we're talking about issues to do with that particular sector. And so I would have expected that the route that you wanted us to go, which is basically the value addition conversation, we suggest that, and it's, I think it's even most uh, a no-brainer. He, he says that your government is passed, <laughs> so you should, yes, you should have but taken, I would say, you see, taken up that. You see, but they just, they left government two and a half years ago, mm. right? So maybe, I mean, for the sake of even the viewers, Elikem could have said that, yes, these are the things that we did as a government. I did mention that. No, let me finish. <laughs> yes, <laughs> in, the, in the value addition <laughs> conversation. Yeah, no, he didn't. The fertilizer. No, no, no. But yeah, but how come there? 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 I was very quiet when okay. you were speaking. I wasn't happy with some of the things that you said, but I was quiet. No, it's because you suggested yeah, you. Yeah, you see, so I feel that, and statistics doesn't lie. And again, when I go back, you say, why am I going back? But when the MPP came to power in 2000, total cocoa production stood at 350,000 metric tons. That is from all the time that we had been doing cocoa. Um, a President Kofor administration took it, doubled that. And when the MPP was leaving power in 2008, it stood at 700,000 and over. Right? And then if you look at the statistics, and even when they want to go out there and start waxing lyrical about the highest cocoa uh, production ever, which is 2010, 
2011. And then you ask yourself, how long does it even take for the cocoa uh, tree to actually start bearing fruits? And if you look at what had happened uh, prior to that, which was the, the spraying gangs and the support to the various farmer groups and the kind of work that went into even what they call, uh, I think it's man there's a system fertilization technique that they have that makes the productivity of that particular tree higher and all of this. Those are innovative things that were brought to bear to bring the sector to this level. As I speak to you, so we can do a back and forth as to the highest and all of those things. But even the NDC's um, performance, where they were giving out the free fertilizer, and I was surprised that he stopped, they were talking about fertilizer being smuggled out of this country for sale and, and everything. I mean, come on, you have to, uh, when you do that, you create issues for yourself. And that was a major reason why uh, the idea of actually uh, getting farmers to pay a certain percentage of the fertilizer and also ensuring that some of the monies are reinvested into the sector itself. And then Ghana is the only country that has actually stopped this, yeah, this, listen, this, this, listen, <laughs> the only country that has actually maintained the price of uh, how much it pays its farmers, even when issues have come in terms of fluctuations and exigencies on the world market. You understand? So we have to be candid with ourselves. Also, even it is not true that local uh, industries are not getting uh, supply of cocoa to do production. As I speak to you, 180,000 metric tons has actually been given to local uh, 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 companies to manufacture. You see, and the thing is that we also understand so, the so sector. The value as we ha has started. Yeah, as we speak, okay. there are companies that are situated at the free zones, including as we speak, the Barricalibers and Cargills and Co., who do uh, a value addition in this country. You understand? Mm -hmm. So for me, I think that, well, like we've been having this conversation about uh, having have a, a certain, if you like, um, dependence on a set, uh, gorgeous bag uh, economies and just producing raw materials and not adding value mm -hmm. and all of those things. It's something that we've, spoke, we, we've spoken about for time memorial, where the idea is that we add value, we activate a value chain so that it increases production and even the value of the, the products and everything to create employment. We are sitting in a situation now where uh, we, we are going into an African continental free trade area agreement where Ghana, by, like, by dint of some work that has been done, is even going to have a secretariat here where we're looking at taking advantage of these things and creating a system where we are adding value to all our produce, not just cocoa. I mean, he was talking about cashew. It's a no-brainer that the prospects and the potential of cashew probably would even outweigh that of cocoa if mm -hmm. we, we, we give it the same kind of um, attention. But if but it doesn't, we yes, cocoa I mean, if it doesn't know, are we giving cocoa I am that aware, attention? I am aware. Eric, are we giving I, cocoa that kind of attention? No, but I think that time... Because we're still exporting our raw, our raw cocoa. No, but we're producing some. That, but, but what I'm saying is that it's important not to get swayed into this whole politicking. Listen, no, we started... No, no, no. Is like it, everything is politicking. We're, we're ex exporting <laughs> a huge chunk of our cocoa. Yes. And the question I'm asking is that, shouldn't we today, 2019, be talking about how much of our cocoa export is being processed here? Yeah, but that is... And the, what we that are is, doing that is, that more. That is, that, is, that, is, that is the vision of this government. As I speak to you, there, there's a, a cocoa production... Um, um, what do you call it, processing plant mm -hmm. that is going to be uh, in somewhere in the tertiary area. You know, a uh, hundred million dollar investment to process cocoa from the tertiary area, as I speak to you. Mm -hmm. Now, from even from top of mind, in the last few years or so, you have had indigenous Ghanaian companies actually setting up cocoa processing uh, entities. As I speak to you, uh, Barry Calibur, Cargill, I think there's Cadbury or so, yeah. and other I entities. Haven't they been there yeah. I mean, but, I but that, they, no, but that is what, let me, let me, let me, let me, let me say it. So, now if you look at the, even the global uh, chocolate market or cocoa market, where you find that the process, Ghana and Cote d'Ivoire, contributes about close to 70% of the world's cocoa production. And we probably, amongst the two of us, 
make just about five billion or so. Then it's a no-brainer. But I'm saying that the efforts to actually uh, do the processing locally is being done. Some of these uh, local companies that are uh, part of these 1D, 1F entities are actually also going to process cocoa. Mm -hmm. So that is, that is key. Now, we all agree. I mean, it's, uh, I, I won't sit here and pretend. We all agree that even for Ghana as a market in terms of the, uh, the population that we have, the 30 million people, if you really want to do serious uh, transformation and serious um, investment, mm -hmm. Any multinational will look at the, this market and say the market is too small. So the next stage is to actually add value to the produce that we have, right, so that we can take advantage of a pan-African market, a global market, a sub-regional market. So these are things, and that dovetails into the whole conversation about a 1D, 1F, setting up of uh, uh, strategic anchor industries, the uh, industrial parks, Supporting by, uh, supported by government and all of those. As I speak to you, the Rural Enterprises Program right, has identified 58 districts that it's actually asked for uh, sponsors, like people who would come, promoters, to come so that we'll set up uh, 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 small, businesses. small businesses, processing facilities. So that's, that's really the crux of the, the, the matter. So okay. as for issues to do with the policy, choices in terms of, okay, give it out for free when the thing actually ends up in Burkina Faso or Benin or Togo or wherever, or let's find a way of making sure that there's uh, some kind of investment coming from the farmers, but there's some kind of reinvestment. He was talking about Kokoros. As I speak to you, almost all the contracts that were issued by uh, Dr. Opuni when I was at well, Kokoro, been reawarded. Some of them are but even okay. I know for a fact that 911 million CDs has been paid to contractors who done did work on the contracts that were awarded. Those who went to, to yeah. the, the, no, the no, roads no. ministry. They, they, they are, yeah, there are two different, different things. I'm saying that okay. under the Cocoa Roads, this government in the last two and a half years, including their Western Regional Chairman, uh, uh, no, Big you, you, you no, 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 but I'm just saying that. 911 million Ghana cities have been paid by this government. Okay. So it's also erroneous and, one minute right and up wrong and then, to create the an impression that well, Coco Rose and it's been abandoned and all of those things and we refuse yeah, to you, pay. You see, and then, again, Eric, as, come back to as classically I like NDC as he is, go and bring everything from everywhere which does not actually uh, speak uh, to the uh, issues. Eric, can wrap up for me. Well, thank you so much. You see, I think my brother rather struggles to defend the situations that we are talking about. In the first place, uh, he is doing the usual thing they do, which is the reason why they're in the quagmire they are when we talk about the free SHS. In as much as everybody has endorsed the fact that it's a good policy, its implementation has been a major challenge for them because there's no policy document backing it and to help they themselves shape that. The reason why when the IMF boss was here, she made them know that without any clear-cut definition of how to fund this project, then it is actually going to take a nose dive. You see, he wants to just try to make Ghanaians again believe, oh, there are plants in the pipeline. We are going to do this at Sheshu. We are going to do this at that. It is easy for everyone to sit on national uh, TV and, and so just say this or truth. that. When, when he was even letting you know that the statistics truth. available from the police does not uh, actually tells that look, uh, yeah, but he didn't issue, so I don't you, have a right. You, you, you didn't, want, don't to, have you didn't right want to take that. To but you want to show me evidence that by, me, okay, by me saying what are you so talking was, about? Was enough. You see, I think the long, the long and short of it all is that this government should stop the too much talking and get to work. It is three years in office, for God's sake, and you are still blaming your predecessor for your shortfalls today. It means you are lost. You just don't know what you're about there. Eric, 10 listen, seconds. Listen, I, I am confident that the government is on the right trajectory. Mm. Uh, everywhere government has touched in terms of sector by sector. There's clear evidence that there's light, it's basically light and day between the NPP government and the NDC government. It's okay and it's fine for us in a democratic dispensation like that for Ghanaians to expect more. And I know that it's, it's part of the whole de de democratic dispensation. But this I'm government grateful. is delivering, it will deliver. It has delivered on the free SHS. But are we out of the hardship? The president himself is grateful. He's, He's a yeah. member of the MPP. We've, we've, we've delivered on the free SHS. We've delivered on making sure that uh, a next member of the NDC team. I am grateful for your Friday morning. Have a fantastic weekend. I uh, we hope to see you next week. Stay here.